Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Michaela Madrid. I'm the operations manager for Sovereign Bodies Institute. I'm also a member of the Lower Brule Lakota Sioux Tribe. Uh, today, we're going to be having a conversation with the family of Rosinda Sophia Strong. Uh, this, this time here is going to be a celebration of her life, uh, talking about what the family's gone through and their advice for others. Um, so if I could have my wonderful panelists come on on screen and turn their cameras on. Hello. So before we get started, um, could everyone just maybe go a round of introductions? Um, let's go Sissy and Chris first. Uh, my name is Christopher Howard Dwayne Strong. I'm Rosin Mizzo's brother. I'm Sissy Strongarius. I am Rosinda's oldest sister, and we are all enrolled for members of the Umatoa tribe and descendants of Yakama Nation. Roxanne? You're muted. Hello, Ink Nosh Winixa, Roxanne White, Wash Nosh, Kinnick Yakima, Ku Nimi Pu, Ku Nuxak, Ku um, uh, Anani Grovant, uh, with Shai Shosh, uh, Duwamish, Sequamish, Chalela, uh, Muckleshoot Territories. Uh, my name is Roxanne White, and I am Yakima Nespers, Nuxak, Grovant, and um, I presently reside here on the Coast Salish territories of the Duwamish, Squamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot peoples. Um, I'm also um, really honored and really grateful to Sovereign Bodies Institute um, for hosting this, uh, for my family, for myself. Um, I am the cousin of Sissy and Chris and um, our beloved Rosinda and it's just really good to be here. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. We're glad to have you all as well. Um, so my first question, and we can start with Sissy and Chris for this one, um, but could you tell us a little bit about who Rosinda was as a person? Um, just anything you'd like for others to know about her? Uh, Rosinda was um, a loving person. She showed love. Um, she was very outgoing very outspoken, um, loved her kids, and always liked to be around family, and loved being around her friends. It was her daily routine, is to be around her friends and her family. And she was just loving and fun to hang around with, and we all miss her. Yeah, she, uh, she really loved her friends. Uh, if you use a close friend or in this, she'd literally go out of her way to, you know, make sure they're safe or, you know, or whatever, you know, happy. That's how there's in the way. She really cared about her friends a lot. She, oh, sorry. She sorry, also you... was a, oh, um, she was also a mother of four children. Um, and today she would have been a grandmother to one. His name is Israel. Okay. Okay. So um, just out of just, you know, total transparency, um, when I think it was like in the early, um, early or middle, I can't remember even when, decades ago, <laughs> um, when, when Sissy and them all still lived on, on Horseshoe Road, um, that was around the last time that I remember, I probably seen them around, but, you know, because of my life experiences and everything, um, I, I've been on and off the reservation. So I don't have a lot of like stories or memories other than the interactions that I had with her happy, loving little spirit. Um, 
one of the things that I will tell you and share is that in this past three years, I feel like, um, and I was just like sharing this with Sissy. I feel like I not only did I get to know Rosinda more through these past three years, unfortunately, um, through these circumstances, but I got to know Sissy and Chris and I got to um, meet Carmen and I got to meet all the nieces and the nephews and, and now Rosinda's grandbaby. And so one of the things that I feel like more than anything is that, um, you know, she loved her siblings and, and she was very, very much loved her children and like any mother, you know? Um, so those are the things that I can share. I've heard so many stories over the past three years by friends, people that she met and impacted um, by her kindness or by her love or by um, even her loyalty and friendship. Those are the things that I've heard countless people say over and over again. And I mean, the thing that comes to my mind is all the things that, uh, you know, that Rosinda will could have been or all the could have done. She could have done this. She could have there. She had her whole life ahead of her. She was fairly young and um, her children were are very young. And so I think that, you know, the possibilities were endless for her um, had this not happened and, and her life wasn't stolen from her. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, it's really clear she was a really beautiful spirit. Um, and I can see that in just how hard your family has been advocating for her. Um, so thinking of that, what does justice for Rosinda look like to you and your family? Uh, justice for us. Um, what I picture is having anybody that knows what happened to her um, held accountable and seeing them be behind bars and actually be able to ask them why. And that's the justice I would like to see for my family is to ask any one of them that were involved, why, why did they take my sister? She didn't deserve that. So I hope justice comes in full effect when information comes and I hope we all as a family can be able to see who and why and be able to see them behind bars. That's what we want. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, just justice and um, you know, just why and I, I, I kind of know why because I know Rosinda was a fighter and you know, she probably didn't want to abide by what they were trying to do to her and one thing led to another and yeah, I just want the people who did that to her incarcerated and have their lives taken away, their family taken away. <laughs> Well, I don't think, it, in my opinion, that, um, you know, true justice, true justice, um, I don't know, all, all kinds of things are running through my head, like um, justice for Rosinda and for, um, for my cousins and for her children and her grandchildren would, would look like, um, First of all, not only every single person that uh, had a hand in um, 
her murder, but all those people to be charged for some laws to be changed around, um, around, um, you know, homicide or even just uh, accessory, you know, um, people that uh, access or, or um, support um, a person that's been murdered. Um, you know, I, 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 I feel like this has happened on uh, our reservation several times. And some of these people are witness and um, accessories to homicide multiple times. And, and at that point, um, are they accessories or are they, um, or are they murders, you know? And that is something that I think needs to change. Also the laws around, um, you know, how, how these investigations go, like just what it looks like. Like justice would mean that, you know, the response would be a lot faster. Um, the response um, would be more um, empathetic from law enforcement, from filing that report, um, and also that there would be systems in place for searches or support for searches or a collaboration between MMIP families and law enforcement. Um, if they don't have the capacity to do that, then, then at least work with the community um, and make some changes for the community to, to, to do this work because when Rosinda went missing, it was about under a month. I remember we wanted to do a search on the Yakima Indian Reservation and were denied or not, we weren't given that permission. Um, and one of the reasons why is supposedly that we could interfere with uh, active, uh, we could tamper with evidence or destroy evidence and all this stuff. But, you know, I really can't, say that I I didn't see any searches happening. I mean, there was no cadaver dogs. There was no anything like what you've seen for uh, uh, the Petita, what is it, Abby or Gabby, Gabby Petita. So, you know, we don't see things like that. We don't, we don't see community come together or law enforcement and do searches had had they done it had we been given permission or had there been an actual search occurring for Rosinda, um i believe that it wouldn't have took 300 days uh 275 i believe that we could have found her a lot sooner so for me those type of things would be justice so that another family does not have to go through these same you know, obstacles and barriers. Um, another thing that I feel like would be justice is, um, is that, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways that, that, but, but, but just not to see Rosinda, her case is, is not as visible as people think. I mean, if, if you are close to me or Sissy or Chris, or our family and our community, our small community, you might hear about it because we're vocal about it. Sissy's extremely vocal on social media, but outside of our community, that's as far as it goes. And the reason why is because, you know, mainstream media and, um, and just the public uh still villainizes um still demonizes criminalizes um victim blames victim shames so i feel like um you know these are the type of things that that need to change as well in order for there to be true justice i don't know why families or um or survivors you know families mmip families i don't know why we have to fight so hard. Why do we have to be so diligent? Why do we have to be so, um, you know, 
out here on the streets, you know, rallying vigils, marches, all these things like society as a whole, um, you know, is so disconnected often just from the fact that, because until you've experienced this, until you've gone through this yourself or, you know, until one of your, your family members have gone missing, um, are people rarely ever able to really just understand what it is that um, uh, not just my family, but Sissy and, and other families experience. So I, I if, if that's answering the question, I think that true justice is like, it's, it's not just one thing. Yeah, we want each person tried and, 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 and prosecuted to the fullest I mean, and we, and the sad thing is we have to stay vocal and we have to stay diligent all throughout this case because we don't want FBI, we don't want anybody to think for one minute that um, we're going to be satisfied with a slap on the hand because that could very well happen. I mean, it could very well happen and this, these people could be out back on the reservation like other MMI families uh perpetrators back on the reservation in less than a decade we're not going to be okay with that so so this has to go to the very end that and we have to and, and my cousin i mean just the strength that that they both need to push even further you know to make sure that that is not the case no plea bargains, no deals, like to the fullest, they must pay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so Roxanne, you spoke to this a little bit, but I wanted to give uh, Sissy and Chris a chance to answer the question. Um, so in your experience, how can law enforcement improve the way that they respond to missing indigenous people? Um, I think they can do better and my experience reporting my sister mission was I pretty much got my sister's background told to me and that's not why I was there so they can do better um, law enforcement that day I can still feel those feelings that day when he tried to dismiss me and my concern that I wasn't there because I just wanted to be there. I was there because I got messages through Facebook that my sister was hurt and she wasn't okay. So when I go to there to report her, he blankly just says, oh, she's out there partying. She'll be back in a couple days. Yeah, she has a record, you know and she has a warrant okay that's not why i was here though so i think law enforcement can do better on that part have some compassion i mean it's their job to protect and serve and i don't think they did that with me that day even could have just said you know i'll check into it let's get this information no i had to storm off crying upset because he just decided to say the things that I already know about my sister, the struggles that she's going through, the addiction battles she's been battling. I don't need you to tell me that. I already know that. I'm her sister. I walk the same road with her even if she's struggling. I'm still there to support her in any way. So there's something wrong. And I just feel that they can do better and follow up on when a family goes and tries to report their loved one missing, not just, oh, we'll get to it. Like, I think it'd be better. We would have more trust and to go to the police because the stuff that I see going on on this reservation do better. I know you guys can do better. 
even the law enforcement can do better. Way better. I mean, it. I know they can. They have. I mean, you did the training. You've done all you can do. So now, bring that training back to reservation and do your job. Not pick and choose when you want to. Not let them go because that's my cousin or that's my auntie or that's my sister's. You know, it's my nephew or that's my niece. If they broke the law, they broke the law. Just do better, because I can still go back to that day, and I'm still mad that I should have made that tribal cop listen to me. I should have made him get in his car and told him, you're going to this house with me to check for my sister. I knew exactly what houses she went to, because my sister told me everything. So, I know just any on any reservation or any law enforcement do better because this epidemic is growing. So, I believe that law enforcement can at least just follow up on any kind of leads or if someone reports their loved one missing, even if they're found a couple weeks later safe or whatever the case may be. At least that cop or officer knows that he did his part as an officer. That's all we ask as a family of MMIP. Do better and follow up because maybe you could possibly save somebody's life. Yeah, the, the Yakima Nation law enforcement here on the reservation is a big time joke. They don't do nothing. When I went and followed my sister's missing report, all they did was take my name and phone number and said they'll get back to me. And nobody never called me not once. They 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 buy new police rigs on this reservation just so they don't have to give money to the tribal members. They buy rigs just for them to sit around at the Yakima and just sit there and just sit there all day long. You know, that's stupid. I'm not even a member of this tribe and I see how that this tribe is mistreated by their own tribal mis tribal council. <clears throat> the Yakima Nation people, they, did, they, they deserve a lot better law enforcement than what they have now. Because all they do around here is just drive around in their rigs and that's all they do is drive. They don't give out speeding tickets. They don't give out nothing. I, I don't know. I just I can't stand the Yakima Nation police around here. They're just... All they do is just drive around and they collect their paycheck. That's all they do. And that's what we mean by do better. You guys have 32 missing individuals, members out there. Just do better. Do your job. That's all we ask as community members. And as the advocates for my sister that went missing on the reservation. And we grew up here. We were born and raised here. My mom's. My mom's member. a tribal member also. My mom's Yakima. My half of my family here on this reservation is Yakima. That's all we ask for is you to do better. If someone goes missing, go look for them. Because like I said, you could possibly save somebody's life. And that would be an indigenous life. That's what's happening to them. Our indigenous people are being targeted by other indigenous people and being killed. And it needs to stop. My sister paid a big price. And I'm not going to, as a family, we're not going to stop until we see everyone that was involved prosecuted and put in jail because we're never going to have resent of that but this is what we what we can do so others don't get hurt or go missing so yeah this, we just want you to do better we know you guys can do better it's like i know as a family we could be better so I know in my heart that you guys have the resources and the funds, use them. 
use them. Thank you. Uh, Roxanne, would you like to add anything? Um, first of all, I, I just want to say that anybody that's watching this, um, what what I'm hearing and what I'm feeling is is like, you know, these are the these are the frustrations and the harm and the hurt um, that has occurred, you know, throughout life, but but at the most difficult time of anybody's life is going and filing that missing persons report. And then, you know, knowing that your loved one has been harmed or or is is missing and there's nothing you could do about it and you the only place you have to go is is you know tribal police sheriffs city police um and at all all these stops you know i've not only my family but i've experienced and 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 have had several families tell me the same thing over and over by all law enforcement you know the the sad thing is is that you know every every one of these um uh jurisdictional um bases that people have to stop at in order to um uh even even you know we, we, what are we going for first of all like what are we what is the the point of a missing persons case if they're not going to do anything I don't get that. I don't think that they really have anything set up for missing people. I honestly think that you file it and it goes to NCIC. I mean, this is the new process. You file it and it does this, this, and this, but that's as far as it goes. I honestly have, you know, done searches um, here in Seattle where law enforcement, they're not out here like, searching and even if they come across a missing person which they have folks that i've been out here searching for see police can come across them and and by law that they're only the only thing they have to do is say do you know you're missing and the you know that they don't are you safe um do you do you need medical treatment? Um, you know, can I help you? Is there somewhere that nothing, these are not the words that, that like, it, it, there's no procedure or policy. And, and, and I get it, like, police right now are going to even use more of like, well, we got defunded or whatever, you know, and cry around about that and use that to not do their job. But even prior to then, these things weren't happening. So I mean, there's just to me, like in listening to my cousins, like this frustration and this anger, like how much more money do we have to pour taxpayers, government, how much more money do we have to pour in to law enforcement um, to get training, to get life skills, just manners. <laughs> do you do you just need to learn manners? How would you want somebody to treat you if your sister was missing? Uh, 101. It, it's like that. It's like, so, I mean, I feel like, you know, if it's not, again, I'm going to keep pushing for this. If it's not law enforcement that is going to do this, then work with the advocates you know, the families that are doing this. Work with those of us that are out here because we have to be, not because we wanna be. And then it comes to this point where it's like, but now we wanna be there for somebody else because we know what it was like. So now we're out here in another capacity supporting other families um because we understand what they're going through so i think that would be the only thing that i would like to add and i'd like to add you know that being being you know we we have this 
this um, blood quantum issue, you know, and I and I feel like it's important to bring up because, you know, that is a, a colonial mindset, a colonial, uh, not even just a mindset, but it's it's one of their laws, the blood quantum thing. Like what happened to, oh, your mom is Yakima. Oh, your grandpa was a uh, scaffold fisherman. I mean, your whole family is, is here, all your relatives, because that's both of us. That's how we are related through our mothers. And so our mothers are Yakima, my grandpa, like, that's why I don't ever acknowledge like where I'm enrolled because that is a whole nother conversation that I'm trying not to get stuck on. But I want to point it out because it shouldn't be when it comes to a missing person, it shouldn't be about who's enrolled, where, who holds a, a, a tribal enrollment card, who holds that, it shouldn't be about that. What it should be about is human life. What it should be about is that here is a native woman or a native child, elder, brother, son that is missing and they matter simply because they're human, not because of where they're enrolled. So I think that that, that is something that needs to change um, everywhere, you know, because it's not just the uh, uh, one tribe like the Yakima Nation, I wouldn't even say it's just them. I would say that this happens on other reservations as well, but this also happens in just regular like city police or Seattle city. I mean, it just depends on who you are, how much money you have, who you know, what you look like, what demographic you fit, you know? I mean, and the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so that leads really well into the next question. Uh, could you talk a little more about your family's experience of having a loved one go missing on a reservation and how not being an enrolled member of that specific tribe impacted your experience? Um, it has impacted us in a way. Um, because we're not tribal members. So it, it's just difficult because it comes to the question, oh, you're, and like they'll blatantly just tell you, you're not enrolled, like we can't help you. Um, or they redirect us to uh, someone that can. So it's kind of like a runaround that we do if we're not from the reservation like and that's what I don't like like I, I like to say like I was born and raised here on this reservation and I'm indigenous and I just feel that you know they don't they don't I don't know how to explain it but like if they weren't taught how to help other indigenous families you know like my mom always taught us to be always take out for our siblings, of course. And if we saw someone struggling, help them, no matter what, who they were, or, you know, what color their skin, if they're Hispanic, if they're native, as I am, we are, you know, we're half Hispanic and we're Native American. So, we always, reporting my sister missing, not being enrolled, I feel like, that's maybe why they didn't help like they should have because they figured, hey, they're not enrolled here. We don't need to help them. And I don't, that's how I felt, you know, at the time of being just reporting her missing, like, like it, should, it shouldn't be like that. Like I shouldn't have to stand there and show them where I'm enrolled and, and you know, it's, I'm there for a reason and I'm recognized federally from a, a tribe like that should be enough for you to, or for anyone just to help you and miss finding or reporting my sister missing and having to just always put that, no, we're not Yakima, no, we're not Yakima, no, we're not Yakima or Umatua. 
it was I felt like it was like segregating me from you know this place and then I even felt myself like do I want to go into the store like are they going to treat me a certain way because they know now that I'm not Yakima or am I going to get treated a different way because we're not enrolled here is just like reporting my sister missing like you know they did ask that is she um what tribe are you guys from oh can they help you okay there that's an organ we're not an organ how can they help me here so that's where that's where just law enforcement can do better but it doesn't matter i say if you're indigenous help them or let them file the report and work together with that other tribe like hey your tribal members over here you know let's work together let's get something going that's i think that could work because like i told my brother you know there's tribal members that live on different tribes different reservations and they're not from there but they're still indigenous so yeah it's it's frustrating it was frustrating at that time when we first reported her missing it was uh really frustrating because when i went to the tribal police to follow for my sister missing it was like they didn't even care you know they, they didn't even ask me any questions at all they didn't ask anything like you know what was she last seen wearing you know, we were, you know, they didn't ask any of that, you know, where, where was she last seen or, you know, who was she last seen with? All they said was just leave your name and number and the chief of police to get a hold of you. And he didn't even get a hold of me at all. And then, like, a couple months after we filed her missing, he had the nerve to get up at the Legends Casino and say that they're doing everything they can for my sister's case and they didn't do crap. You know, and that's the frustration I hate is, they, they, they say they do things, but they don't. They just, you know, they're, they're just trying to make their public image look good. Yeah, they do it all for the, you know, photo and get publicity and, you know. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. It has to be more than just um, MMIP, MMIW, MMIR, whatever acronyms you uh, choose to use, um, representing, you know, missing and murdered indigenous uh, people, human beings, Native Americans, uh, indigenous people. I feel like we are still in the early stages. So we're not, I mean, we're not going to reinvent the wheel if we can try. I mean, everybody can try, I guess. But remember um, that this epidemic is not new, for one. This is um, the genocide has been occurring for 527 years um, since Christopher Columbus uh, uh, landed on um, these shores. And I would, I would like to say that this is not new, um, but it has, it has transitioned and morphed into different things throughout the centuries. And I would say probably in the past couple hundred years, what we have is, you know, this buildup of this society that um, Europeans or this government colonial world wants to build, which the whole system was built off of racism, was built off of genocide. So when we look at it and we think about all of this stuff and we think about where we're at now, Canada, um, our First Nations relatives um, are have been fighting, you know, publicly and on the streets, families for almost three decades. They have done so much work and they're not that far, you know, like as far as like really just trying to make police change or, or 
you know, stop racism because that's what it really comes down to. The awareness, yes. Um, the the tribes and the people are building and everything, but like to break the system that is already like founded and rooted in racism and all this stuff. Um, just thinking about like law enforcement and and tribal police and all these things. It has to be more than these early stages of of like just wearing red. It's more than wearing red or putting a red hand on your face. It's more than putting a red hand on your face um, or a red ribbon skirt or regalia. Um, and I'm not knocking any of these things because I, I too believe that, you know, our, those are prayer skirts. So if you're gonna wear a prayer skirt, you know, that's great. You're bringing prayer. If you're gonna wear your wing dress or your regalia, you're coming in prayer, but also like, this, this is about real issues. These are about real lives that, and so we need more than just these things. That's what I'm saying. We need more than just for people to get together and take photos. I mean, you see, we do it, but where, when we do it, like, I mean, I guess it's, it's a documentation of a, of a gathering that we've done, right? But for those that are just coming out and supporting, I would like to encourage people to do more than just come out at an event, although we do appreciate it. We, 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 we appreciate it to the utmost because our events, and I was just thinking about this, Sissy, we have about like 30 people that have loyally and faithfully come to our events, family members, friends um, that have come to our events over the past three years. And it gets makes me emotional because we would have been just there by ourselves without these people. So we do appreciate that. I don't want to make that sound like we are not appreciative, but we need the greater public also to do more. We need people to get involved at, at, at a whole nother level. And so, and, and I think like what, what started me on this is because when Chris said, you know, it's more than just taking pictures, the tribe right now, this is for, this is for council. This is for, this is for um, MMIW task force. These are for people that are building these task force all over and, and yet aren't even involved, you know, we need people to get involved. We need people to be boots on the ground. We need people to, to do more than just talk, do more than just sound good and use your education. But we need people to go a little bit further and actually find out, ask families, how can we help? Lend your, be a real, like, like that word ally, but be an accomplice, be an accomplice, like use your skills, offer these families your skills they need a lot you know we need a lot there's things that you may have from your academia that you could support us with or maybe you have the gift of like finding funds come on we need all those things families need those things um yeah i mean just technical admin style stuff like there's things that these that many of us need. And, and I say that because most of this stuff that we're hearing, um, you know, around the world, like everybody's talking about MMIP, but, but when it's time, where is our councils? Where, where are the people that are saying they're doing this work? And I mean, that's just across the board, everybody. So when we're thinking about actions and resources that are helpful, um, what kind of resources or services are helpful for families with a missing or murdered loved one? Is there anything that you wish you would have had or that you did have that was really helpful? Yes. Um, I wish in the beginning we got more help from the resources that were in 
my community, but those resources never reached out to us. At, at, you know, um, and if they did, they didn't come back and make sure like, hey, did you get my email or did you get my message? Did you get my phone call? Because I've been trying to reach out to you send a notice to their house or anything like I know there's resources in my community but at the time I didn't know about them and I really wish I would have because we want to have to have like people like you know we asked for money then we did fundraisers um my cousin Roxanne had resources from Seattle and she's I I didn't know we had resources here in my in Toppenish or the Lower Valley, but my cousin from Seattle is the one that helped with like flyers, um, just getting her to be known out there. I wish that those resources are visible because they weren't visible for us as a MMIW family. Nobody made it visible to us or literally like Said, hey, look, this is what we have to offer you. Yeah, I just now that I know we have that those resources, that's why I say use them, utilize them. Being the public, get that information out. Why are you guys keeping it a secret in that office? What is in there that you guys should be giving that? information out or going to the 32 families that have missing loved ones and offering them any type of help i mean even if they decline put that in the note the family doesn't want to speak we've reached out to them numerous times we've even reached out after six months it's still the same you get paid by the hour to do this stuff but i as a family member we didn't know there were resources out there for us to grasp and get a hold of and to utilize those for us because I worked overtime sometimes um, to get stuff for my sister's events or walks. Um, I made fundraisers and made sure all that money went to that event. So it would have been nice to know about those resources and if we have them in the community I believe that they should be visible and need to be talked about more and be available whenever if like someone's being reported missing like at two in the morning I believe somebody should be available or advocates so they can go with them and make sure they're getting all the information like um, what like my brother said what were they last seeing you know those questions weren't asked to us so I hope that the resources in my area start utilizing them and making them visible for other families because we didn't know anything about none of these resources and I guess they've been here even before my sister disappeared so that shows you a lot that those I wish I could be some kind of an assistance on like how to get those resources out or even to help my community put those spaces visible because I believe visibility is everything and there's 32 missing where I'm from and that's just indigenous so I believe they should be visible and if there are programs that are for MMIW, MMIP, we get those flyers out, utilize those resources, and yeah, because me and my family, we didn't know about any of the resources, like the Regalia program, um, behavioral health services, um, and I'm not even saying anything bad, it's just we as a family, we didn't know about those resources, so I know there's enrolled members here that probably could use those, so I hope those get used, and in the future they can do better also. And when and when it comes to stuff like that, even if we try to get the resources, they would probably just tell us no anyway because we're not Yakima. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, um, what else was I say? 
Yeah. Well, yeah, they would just tell us no because we were in Yakima. And, or if it, 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 like, you know, this was really depends on who you're related to, if, if your family's on the general council or not. That's the only way you'd really get help, get, you know, get help or not. <clears throat> Did you say what 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 resources programs? Yeah. So the question is, uh, what services or resources are helpful for families with a missing or murdered loved one? So it, going back, like when um, when Rosinda first went missing, there was absolutely nothing. <laughs> there was nothing. I mean, just point blank, nothing. Um, and as far as like me being a resource, the only thing that I had to offer was, and, and the only thing that I really ever had to offer was, um, you know, the, uh, see, cause I mean, that that's a, a lot of people like, see me being grassroots and the way that I got here and in, in the, you know, when Rosinda went missing, I was like already on this journey of like speaking about my own experiences, you know, um, my aunt being murdered, um, what law enforcement didn't do, what prosecutors didn't do, um, just realizing that I, I have, you know, experiences like this, um, I've experienced this, like this trauma, this pain from this system, you know, and this injustice and not just by her, but by, you know, being trafficked and by being um, raped and, and, and um, abducted from my home and never seeing any justice all my life being um, domestically abused and never seen justice. So, you know, all the things that I experienced in my own life was kind of how I got here to being a resource. And my, um, the work that I was doing was like, you know, environmental justice, um, uh, indigenous rights, native rights, um, you know, speaking on, you know, my own, me being a survivor, me being a family member of MMI, and then, and then like just going from there, like realizing like just how the pull from our ancestors and how much this is needed right now for us as a people. And I think that that all of those things, you know, bringing, bringing us to where we're at, me being able to be there for my cousin, me actually being, I don't even, I think I was in Lummi at the time, I, I was doing something and it was around trafficking um, when Rosinda first went missing. And when I got back, I, I called uh, or I reached out to Sissy and the only thing that I knew, and, and it's just of, of just knowing, the only thing I knew was to be visible like we i remember remember like it was yesterday telling sissy like well we're gonna have to do like a prayer walk and you know i mean and it's like this you know and i smile when i say this but the only reason why i smile is because i know that it, she was in a lot of pain her and chris and it makes me smile to see both of them today like chris just going in on what he doesn't like and then Sissy just telling all the things that she's come to know and grow and just makes me emotional because three years ago, that wasn't the case. And when we first did our first prayer walk, it was, it was that in itself, like feeling their brokenness and trying to be there for them so that they could, so that we could find Rosinda or that we could figure out, like we could get somebody to break the silence, right? Somebody on the reservation to, to, to like tell the truth or to call in or, or make a statement, 
to go on record so that um, so that we could bring her home. And unfortunately, because the way that the streets are and the way that the drug epidemic and addiction and gang violence on our reservation, on the Yakima reservation, on many reservations, nobody was willing to do that. So, you know, it took all this time. Took It's taken, it, it, we're still waiting, right? So I just say that a lot of people since from then to now have supported. I can't even say all the names. I mean, I think Sovereign Bodies Institute, you guys have supported us when um, we buried Resinda, you know, um, Mother Nation. There's a lot of people coming out of the woodwork that are starting to like to have funding and they're they're offering families help. Um, the Red Blanket Fund currently out of Na'a Ilahi, um, the Snowbird Fund out of Montana. There's a lot of different funds that are starting to occur, but three years ago, four years ago, nothing, nothing. Um, what we're going to see, and I'll just say this and, and be quiet because I just feel it's really important that we got to continue to stay on these organizations that, you know, grateful for the funds, but we also need um, people that are willing to do this work alongside families. We also need, we need more than money. We need, we need tangible resources and trainings and different things to help these families um, to be self-sufficient, to offer these grassroots families that are doing this work, some kind of, of, of trainings and, and, and education and support so that they can continue. Some of these families will be searching a lifetime and may never bring their loved one home. And we owe that to these people. As a, as a community, we owe that love and support to these families. But there's been so many that have helped us. I mean, I've been able, I can't even name all the community members, you know, that's really who's been supporting my work for a really long time was like the community, allies, friends, people that believe in what I'm doing and supporting that, you know? So, I mean, yeah, I, I can't even think of everybody. Like, can you think of somebody else, Sissy, that you want to add to, like, that has helped along these past uh, couple years? Um, well, SBI, Mother Nation. Um, you, Roxanne. You. <laughs> You've been a big You've been there a lot, Chris. Right? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, really, really love you. There's so many. I mean, there's Lori, Lori Thomas. She's helped. Um, Tina Michelle. I've had. Um, That's the one from our tribe, Love It, Um, Jill Marie that Gavin's was? helped in the past. Um, We've had so many people help us. And your your friend from Ken? Yeah. Your friend from Ken, Washington? Yeah, your, yeah, and, um, and just Gina? everybody else. Yeah, Gina? You know. There's, there's. Rhonda Henning from Missing. Yes, Rhonda. Um, this a lot. Mona. Our new cousin Rick. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was also thinking of one other person. Um, uh, oh. Who is it? Oh, Unkitawa. Unkitawa has been supporting um, with different things here and there. So that's one other org that I think uh, Yakima Herald Republic, too. Yeah. They've, they've been really helpful oh, with this. Yeah, Yakima Herald has um, been very helpful keeping. Um, my sister and MMIP and family is visible here. Um, Tammy Ayers done an awesome job. What about because, when we went, remember when I went to that powwow up in uh, Parkston? 
and I and they let me do that. Um, yeah, the the money, they the did, money blanket money. Boy, money like blanket ceremony, <laughs> and they they put a blanket out there. I think, and what was it like? Something like how much money was it, Susie? Like it was it was over like five hundred dollars. It yeah, was, it was over that. That was a big deal. I mean, Rhonda's given us those bands before to sell. Bands, yes. Yeah. Um, We've had different, different people. I mean, yeah. Um, oh, and then the Yakima Nation powwow did let us um, do the walk for in the, their powwow um, oh, yeah, and let yeah, us set up our yeah. tent and stuff for to give out information for Rosenda and others that were missing. And that was yeah. really helpful because there was a lot of other indigenous oh, families there. At the time. USA. Yes, and oh, MMIWSA. Like too. Yes, it has been oh, a big Decker help Bay too for, since Rosenda's went missing. Um, and, uh, Roxanne, who's, who's the person that you helped me with the, uh, with my with my van to give me the $500? Yeah, MMIWSA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell him thank you. I really, really appreciate that. Oh, yes, yeah. so we got his van fixed, and yeah, from the funeral. <laughs> thank them. I really appreciate that, man. Yeah. It helped me a lot. It was very helpful. So there's also oh, there's so many people like yeah. I mean, my friends, my family too. That's always here. Yeah, like. My cousin Agnes Thompson from Sacramento, she helped with a um, thousand dollars for my sister's casket. Um, and she's, I'm just glad my family here too. You know, I don't come from a big family, so you know, there's like the strong sisters and CC Violet and Samantha. I really, really like. Um, they're they're all three sisters, so they every time I see them, they remind me of me and my sister. So I just wanted to make sure and just you know, I'm actually getting close to with like some of my family that I knew was my family, my cousins growing up, but I've actually you know it wasn't the way, but I feel that my sister did pay a price, a big price, to bring this to light but in a way i feel like she brought me and my family closer together she was always a she was a family person she she didn't like Rosanna didn't like us fighting she didn't like us arguing she'd be like yeah yeah stop it or no no stop it like we're not here to fight and argue like we're supposed to get along like we're i mean like me and Rosenda, we would fight and argue, and like if she just leave, she'd be like I just didn't want to disrespect you, Nana, so I'm just gonna go. And when she leave, I text her, be like, No, I was not done. You know, I text her, and she'd be like, OMG, Nana, I love you. Just I'll, we'll finish it later, okay? She'd always tell me that we'll finish it later, okay? And it was an argument, and I'd tell her, You know, we ain't gonna finish it later. She's like, I know that's why I tell you that. She's like, Cause you'll forget about it. <laughs> but. We're gonna, we miss Rosenda every day, and we just hope um, we've given other families insight that if your loved one comes up missing, don't be afraid to be their voice. So I know I've had that asked to me in the beginning, why are you doing this? Or why are you trying to bring attention to this? Um, I just went with my heart and I know that's what my mom would have wanted me to do as well as my sister. So that being said, you know, my sister was just very loving and she just loved being a mom and a friend. So I miss her every day and I know her daughter does too. She's having a hard time, especially the month of October is always hard for us because all those feelings come back, all the everything else comes back, even like to, you know, like reporting her missing to it's 
you know, but I'm just, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, my sister's finally <laughs> home with my mom what? and other family members. And Dude. just hope that we can be, <laughs> be a more help, you know, to, to other families, not to be afraid to speak up for their loved ones. Well, it's so beautiful to just hear how the community has really surrounded you and, you know, that this has brought your family closer. Um, what advice do you have for other MMIP family members uh, when it comes to uh, self-care and healing? Um, um, I, self-care, I have done very little of because I'm always doing something and honestly I just I I honestly personally haven't started to care for Sissy yet because I still feel like I'm not done with my sister. Um I have tried to step back and to give myself space and I don't know how. So I know in when I sit and think by myself that I know I do need some counseling and it's just hard in my community to trust the ones that um, that are in those positions you know so I I don't know what self-care looks like yet but I know it's me getting up every day going to work providing um, just keeping myself busy. I'm in school. So my day is pretty, you know, booked up. Um, I have been just taking a little time for myself um, in my car. Um, I've been, I've been saying like, um, like smudging and stuff that I've been doing a lot of that lately. So I guess there's little things I do in self care, but I haven't fully care for myself fully yet and I hope to start soon because it's so much trauma and all the things that I went through in the past three years and just stuff that seeing my sister go through and I believe that yeah me and my family could use some counseling in that area so I hope to be in some kind of counseling soon that's what it looks like for me. Oh my God, yeah. uh, what was the question again? Uh, so the question is, what advice do you have for MMIP family members who are in need of self-care in healing? A lot of prayer. Um, no. Um, yeah, just prayer. Just believing that you can get through the day, and I don't know. It's like that's like a weird question for me. But yeah, just prayer, I guess. I just love my. <laughs> I just, I just want to squeeze, pinch your cheeks right now, Chris. Um. <laughs> uh i i really like this is the this is the question uh you know it's it's actually like a question that i you know just just being transparent kind of like i'm gonna just share something like i was like oh i really really think you know we should talk about you know uh our self-care you know like these type of things because because it's so important like for us to do this like you know i want i want i want like for my self-care like what i do is you know um of course i have medicines and i have prayer and i do sweats and um i occasionally still go to a uh, 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 woman's um sacred circle aa meeting and 
Um, you know, I do like different things. Like, I don't know, to me, like, like having fun and, and, and hanging out with friends, laughing, having a meal, like visiting, going home to visit. Those things are, are also self-care, but I also do therapy. I've been in therapy for, um, geez, going on, uh, five years of, of trauma therapy. And, um, so those are the things that I'm doing, but even with all of that, I can't even tell you that I still feel like I need double that. <laughs> I need double that. Like it's not enough. Cause like at different times of the day, or maybe it is enough, but it's just learning that balance, right? It's learning how to balance. And I'm constantly trying to learn how to like have boundaries too. Like boundaries is a big word I've been, and it's not just a word, it's action actually, but I've been really working on this boundaries thing. Like what are my boundaries? What is a healthy boundary? What do I need? What does Roxanne need? Cause like I have been like putting everybody else before me for a really long time. And just like, so to me, that's that's like the self care, right? <laughs> trying to trying to figure out what what I need, what Roxanne needs. So, and that's what I would tell other families is, you know, I would I would tell other families like whatever a higher power, whatever prayer uh, way of life that works for you to, you know, connect to it, like and also like you know i think like that that whole of, of wanting to help others because i can only go off of my experience so like like i'm the middle child so <laughs> i i was always like this like caretaker type of person i remember like when i was a little girl you should be a counselor and i'm like no, I don't want to be a counselor. Like I was a kid, people saying that. So there's obviously something wrong with me, right? Like a long, long time ago, like, you know, and, it, and so now I'm looking at it like, oh my gosh, like what I was is like very codependent. And so like learning things about, that's all I've been on is this healing journey of learning Roxanne and, and it's been painful and it's been, um, it's been a lot of things, you know, but what I would tell families is like to find that power, that meditation, that prayer life, whatever it is, and also find, this is like the, if I could just tell all families, like, I know that you're going through like the worst, most hardest time in your life right now. But in order to sustain the days to come, the year to come, we got to pour back into ourselves. We have to, or else we can't be there for our grandkids. We can't be there for our nieces and nephews. We won't be good for ourselves because we can't, I mean, we got to be good for ourselves so we can help other people too, because that's just our nature. That's for many of us, that's who we are. So Please remember to love yourself, to take care of yourself, drink lots of water and find things that bring you joy. Somebody told me that a long time ago, or I might've heard it on a movie or something, I don't know, but find what brings you joy. And I was, and I'm still trying to find that. Like, I'm still trying to figure that out. Like what brings Roxanne joy? Like, and I find those in little things throughout my day. So I think that's a big thing, but also surround yourself with people that love you, that support you, that are good to you because you deserve that. 
Beautiful. Thank you so much for those words. I think all of us, you know, family members, those in this work, uh, I think self-care is always something that we could be better on. So, so for those watching, for those on uh, our panelists, don't feel bad if you don't feel like you have your self-care routine down, because I think that's something that we're constantly all working on. Uh, so we're coming up close to the end of our time here. And so I just wanted to give you all opportunity. Is there any closing thoughts or anything that you'd really like to leave the audience with today? No, I'm just uh, thank you to whoever's listening and watching. And I think because of now, because of the past three years, whoever has to report a missing person, you know, I think now you're probably going to get a lot more, you know, better support, maybe, hopefully, you know, maybe, maybe more, maybe more closure faster or whatever. Well, I, I guess I just want to thank you all for watching and listening. Because if you watch and listen, then, you know, it matters to you. Thank you. Um, same. Um, I just want to thank everybody. Um. SBI for bringing us on and my cousin Roxanne. Um, thank you for listening and watching. And we hope that we can make it a little bit easier and better for the next, hopefully not in the near future or even if another MMIW gets brought to light, you know, they find the remains, um, they will know what to do. And um, I just want to thank or tell everybody thank you for listening because it does mean everything to us, especially this is a grown epidemic. So um, please take care of yourselves, watch your surroundings, especially with the time change. Um, um, especially at night, don't go out by yourselves. Um, it has become very dangerous in all areas. So always take caution and always check on your loved ones. Yeah, even, even if you don't see them for you know three, four days, you know, take a drive, you know, go out and you know, make sure they're okay. You know, they're they're around still at least. You know, it wouldn't hurt to you know just check real quick. Yeah, um, I think like at this point, if you've watched the whole video or if you're just live feed or the stream and you're just coming on, like this being the most important part. So share it with somebody, tell them to watch it all the way through. Um, one of the biggest things that I would like to just share with community and to kind of piggyback off of what my cousins just said is, you know, prevention we're obviously like not not here to like this isn't like the kind of panel or webinar or we're but i think we, if we probably one thing that we did kind of like miss was prevention and i'm going to just say prevention is is healing prevention is awareness prevention is education prevention is culture prevention is our language it's our ceremonies, it's, um, it's love. Prevention is, is um, providing, you know, meals and it's, it's whatever that comes from love, from safety, right? I think prevention is, is um, the fight against drugs. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the battle that many of us see in our lives, whether you're on or off the reservation, we experience it through our families and through this um, historical and intergenerational trauma. So prevention is like so many things. And I'm gonna just say like, it's a lot of people, you know, when they're talking, when we're talking about prevention, um, I always think it's interesting, like when they're doing these physical fight trainings like teach your girls how to fight. We are fighters. What are you talking about? Like most of us, and, and, and I'm, I'm gonna just speak from my own experience. 
all the the fights that I was in growing up and through my adult life and all of that stuff, like my physical ability to fight did not save me. And I know Rosinda was a fighter because we're no match for 10 people. We're no match for a gun. We're no match for those kind of things. So prevention is, is right here to right here. It's, it's those things. And so I, I would like to see more prevention in our community, like what that looks like, what the healing looks like, what the, what the ceremony, like the education with all of those things, like prevention is realizing that if you go to a bar and your family just leaves you there and you have to hitchhike and you ask somebody for a ride, realizing that you're at the highest risk right there that you may never come home because that's a reality on our res. Or you're at a party and somebody offers you some dope, you never done it before. It puts you right at risk in the highest risk of being in those places. You know, um, there's just so many ways. It's just being, being aware and, and being educated and having all the tools and the resources to pour into our community in a positive, good way. We don't have enough of that. Thank you. Well, I know I can speak for myself in saying that this, I've learned so much from you all and I'm just in awe of your strength and your courage to stand up day in, day out and fight for justice for your sister, for your relative and, and for our communities as well. Um, so I'm really grateful that we have people like you out there in this world. Um, and, and I look forward to a day that, you know, this isn't an issue that our community faces anymore. Um, so thanks again for everyone watching um we will see you next time on the next thank you Michaela <laughs> yes so awesome. thank, thank you, you.